Okay, so <clears throat> we'll begin as usual with the recitation of the prayers. <clears throat> and while doing these prayers, it's good if you can to imagine in the space in front of you, Shakyamuni Buddha, who is the founder of this tradition of teachings and practices that we are studying and following. <clears throat> Imagine him made of light, radiant, pure, blissful. And his face shows his state of mind of immeasurable great compassion and love and concern for all living beings throughout the universe, including you. In the Buddha's mind, there's not the slightest trace of any kind of negative attitude, like anger or irritation or uh, judgmentalness, criticalness. So he's totally accepting and forgiving, even if we've made very big mistakes and we have very strong delusions. Buddha doesn't hold that against us. He completely accepts us as we are and is completely dedicated to helping each and every one of us until we too are free of all of our afflictive emotions and have developed our potential for enlightenment and have reached the same state that he has reached. I really try to feel the Buddha's compassion and love and complete dedication to being there for us, helping us, taking care of us until we reach enlightenment. And he has that same attitude towards every other living being, even the ones we find very difficult to deal with. Buddha doesn't find them a problem. He's completely dedicated to helping them as well. So now let's take refuge and generate bodhicitta. <clears throat> I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my practice of giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my practice of giving and other perfections, May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my practice of giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. And to further enhance our altruistic intention to benefit others, we recite the four immeasurable thoughts. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. And in order to actually make progress on the spiritual path, we need to accumulate a lot of merit, positive energy, and also purify negative energy. So the seven limb prayer contains the most important practices for doing those two things. Reverently, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the merit of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until the end of cyclic existence and turn the wheel of Dharma for living beings. I dedicate my own merits and those of all others to the great enlightenment. And then we offer the mandala, imagining the whole universe, all that is beautiful, precious, pleasing, transformed into a pure land offered to the Buddha and all the holy beings and wishing all sentient beings could experience the pure land. 
This ground anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. May all living beings enjoy this pure land. Yidam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam So now let's recite the mantra of the Buddha three times and imagine light flowing from the Buddha into yourself and into all other beings around us. And this light uh, completely fills our bodies and minds and purifies all negative energy, physical and mental. And it blesses or nourishes our positive potential, all our good qualities, which we can cultivate more and more, and eventually they become enlightened qualities. Taya ta om mune mune maha munaye soha Taya ta om mune mune maha munaye soha Taya ta om mune mune maha munaye so Let's take a few more minutes to make sure that our motivation is as positive and altruistic as possible. So in this class, we've been going through the Lamrim, the stages of the path to enlightenment. And currently we're on the middle scope of the Lamrim. And this section of the Lamrim looks at samsara or cyclic existence what it is and why it is so problematic or unsatisfying and why we need to develop the attitude of renunciation or the determination to be free of samsara. So sometimes it can sound like samsara is somewhere out there, outside of ourselves, but in actual fact, samsara the real meaning of samsara is right here, our, our very body and mind, our five aggregates, which um, are under the control of afflictions, greed, hatred, ignorance, and other afflictive emotions, and karma. So we've accumulated a huge amount of karma in our career in samsara from beginningless time. And it's our karma that is responsible for the experiences that we have, <clears throat> taking rebirth again and again in samsara and having different experiences, both good and bad. But nevertheless, they're always samsaric experiences, which means they're contaminated or polluted. They're not completely pure and perfect and satisfying. So this very body and mind that we have, that's sitting here right now, wherever you may be, this is samsara. <clears throat> and as long as, <clears throat> as long as this is the case, as long as we are in samsara, as long as we have samsaric aggregates, we're never completely free and we're not able to experience real, lasting, <clears throat> genuine happiness and peace. <clears throat> so samsara is sometimes compared to being in a prison Nobody likes that. We like freedom. And in a prison, you don't don't have freedom. You can't go where you want, do what you want. You're under the control of others. So as long as we're in samsara, it's like that. We're like in a prison. But what keeps us in the prison is internal factors, not anybody out there, but within our own mind afflictive emotions, ignorance, greed, hatred, and so on, and karma. So this is what we need to recognize 
and generate the strong wish, the strong determination to be free. And the long room is written for those who want to attain enlightenment, Buddhahood, to be able to help all living beings. But we still have to go through this process of learning about samsara because we have to free ourselves from samsara in order to reach enlightenment. And we also have to understand how other sentient beings are stuck in samsara. What is the mechanism that keeps them in a situation of suffering again and again. So we do have to understand these things and generate the determination to free ourselves so that we can then have the de determination to free all other living beings from samsara, which is the basis for bodhicitta. <clears throat> So do the best you can to generate the aspiration to listen to these teachings, not just for yourself, for your own happiness, but for the happiness and welfare of all living beings, to be able to help all of them be free of samsara, help all of them reach enlightenment. And we have to do that ourselves first. Okay, so <clears throat> last week we started looking at the 12 links. So the 12 links is a rather complicated topic. I'm trying to make it easy. <laughs> and, um, but it is important to understand because it, it, it's the explanation for how it is that we are stuck in samsara you know we say that oh we create karma and then it's our karma that causes us to be reborn in samsara again and again and again but how does that actually work what is the process what is the mechanism so um it's it's the the 12 links that explain that and this is something it said that just before enlightenment when the buddha was sitting under the bodhi tree meditating just before he reached enlightenment he gained insight into these 12 links he, he could see in his own experience how they operate and so this is a really important part of his teaching um so if you could put the slides up <clears throat> first next slide <clears throat> so these are the 12, um, just to remind you in case you forgot. Um, so first is ignorance and then formative actions. Sometimes it's called karmic formations or compositional factors. It's just karma, basically. <laughs> so number two is karma. Three is consciousness. So last week I got up to um, number five. So I'll just briefly review that, oh, those first five, and then we'll continue from number six today. Um, so the first one is ignorance, and different Buddhist schools explain um, what type of ignorance is the first link. They, they have different explanations about that. But the Lamrim follows mainly the Madhyamika Prasangika school, so according to that school, um, ignorance refers to the uh, belief in or grasping at an inherently existing self, I, and also 
everyone and everything else um, seen as inherently existing. So that grasping at inherent existence is the ignorance, which is the first link. And that's the root of samsara. That's our main problem, the thing we have to get rid of. So under the influence of ignorance, our mind is kind of very addicted to ignorance. So it's always there in our mind. Then we create karma. We do actions, which is link number two. And um, we create lots of karma, but only some of the karmic actions that we create are the cause of a rebirth. So uh, it's explained in, in the teachings on karma, which we went through earlier. Um, a complete action has four aspects to it, an object, an attitude, a performance, and a completion. So um, a complete action has the power, the strength to bring about a rebirth, an actual birth in one of the six realms of samsara. So that's the kind of karma in link number two. It's the kind of karma that can actually cause a new life, a new rebirth. <clears throat> and then the third link is consciousness. And this doesn't refer to all the different instances of consciousness because consciousness is very complex, but the specific moment of consciousness that's present at the time we do one of those actions and that imprint, karmic imprint or karmic seed gets kind of placed or planted in that consciousness. So it's that moment of consciousness where the karmic seed gets planted. And actually, in, if you go into detail, there's two aspects of consciousness. One is called the causal consciousness. That's the one that's there at the time we do the action and the seed gets planted on it. And then as time goes on, consciousness is changing. It's like a stream flowing through time, always changing. Karmic seeds are also always changing because they're impermanent by nature. <clears throat> but then sometime in the future, it could be in the next life, or it could be many, many lifetimes later, when we finally do take rebirth as a result of that karmic action that we did, that first, the first moment of that new life, okay, that the consciousness that's there at that first moment of the new life is the resultant consciousness. So that's also part of link number three. So it has two aspects, a causal consciousness and a resultant consciousness. And then link number four is called name and form. And that refers to our five aggregates of the new life. So when we do take this new rebirth, um, right, according to Buddhism, right from the moment of conception, um, even if it's just a little fertilized egg or zygote or embryo, whatever you want to call it, it's not yet a fully developed being, but um, consciousness is there. And that Con contains all five aggregates. The five aggregates are there. So name and form refer to the, the, new, the new life right from the moment of conception. The six sources refer to the six uh, sense powers or six sense faculties related to our six consciousnesses. So we have six different consciousnesses, seeing, hearing, smelling, taste, um, tactile bodily consciousness and then the sixth consciousness is the mental consciousness consisting of our thoughts our emotions our dreams our memories all that stuff going on in, seemingly in our head but it's actually in our mental consciousness and so for each of the six consciousnesses there's what's called a sense faculty or sense power and so, for example, for the eye, you know, to be able to have visual consciousness, to be able to see, um, there needs to be a properly functioning eye sense power, which isn't the actual eyeball, like, you know, what you can see, but it's said to be a subtle kind of matter, subtle kind of form located somewhere in the eyeball. <laughs> That's how it's explained in Buddhism. It's a little complicated. But anyway... Um, and then in the ear, there's the ear sense power, the nose sense power, tongue sense power, body sense powers all throughout the body. 
And that's why we're able to feel physical sensations, except our nails and hair and teeth and so on. But the other parts of our body, we're able to have um, tactile sensations. We feel sensations in our body because of the presence of this body sense power. And then the mental sense power um, that enables mental consciousness to arise, that's actually the previous moment of mind. So that's not a physical sense power as with the other five, but it's the previous moment of mind that changes and gives rise to the next moment of mind. Well, that, that's a little complicated, but anyway, that's just to mention the six sources. So it said that let's, let's say a baby, a, a, a newly conceived human child in the womb, right from the first moment of conception already has the body sense power and the mental sense power. So those are already present, but the others develop gradually. Obviously there's no eyes yet, <laughs> no ears. <laughs> so as the embryo develops in the womb and the different physical organs develop, then the, um, the sense powers also develop. So at a certain point, I don't know exactly when, while the baby's still in the womb, it will have all of the six sense powers and we'll be able to start having all six types of consciousness. Although again, right from the beginning, there is body, uh, body consciousness and mental consciousness um, operating. But the other four seeing and so forth develop later. Um, so those are the six sources. So I'll continue with number six today, contact. But there was a question that was sent in. This is related to um, link number two, formative actions or um, karmic formations. As I mentioned, there's three different kinds of, of karma, virtuous karma that causes rebirth in um, one of the three fortunate realms as a human, as a human being or as a deva in the desire realm or as an asura in the in some traditions they actually include asuras in the lower realms <laughs> in our, our, our tradition it's included in the upper realms it's kind of more related to the gods um, so anyway in order to be born in one of those three realms you need to create virtuous karma like abandoning killing abandoning stealing practicing generosity and so on. And then there's non-virtuous karma, which is the cause to be born in one of the three unfortunate realms <clears throat> as an animal or a, a hungry ghost or a, a being in hell. <clears throat> and then the third type of karma is called immovable or invariable karma. And this is the karma that causes rebirth in the form of the formless realms. So that's above the desire realm. And those are devas. The beings in those realms are all classified as devas or gods with a small g. But there's many different levels of those. And to be born in um, one of those realms, one needs to develop very, very strong concentration. In our tradition, it's said that you first have to develop calm abiding, which itself is quite a high achievement. <laughs> it takes a lot of effort. And then on top of that, after developing calm abiding, you engage in other kinds of meditative practices to uh, attain um, what are called, well, the first, the first of those levels is, is called the first concentration or the first jhana. Jhana is the, I think that's the Pali term in um, Sanskrit is jhana. Um, yeah, so it, it, it's, it's, uh, it requires quite a bit of effort and very, very, very strong concentration to attain those. Um, yeah, so, so we talk about the jhanas. There's four jhanas that's related to the form realm. And then there's four meditative absorptions related to the formless realms. So if you want to be born in one of those realms, you have to develop that um, respective state of mind. So to be born in the first jhana, which is the first level of the form realm, you have to develop the meditative state of the first jhana, which is, you know, quite a big uh, effort. So anyway, this question that came in is, 
Um, does being able to practice the jhanas mean that you're creating immovable karma to be born in those realms? Or does that depend on other factors such as attachment to the experience? This is actually kind of complicated. So I'm going to give an answer, but if you don't understand it, don't worry. It's, it's, it's a very, very complicated topic. How, how you attain the jhanas, uh, the four concentrations and the four um, formless absorptions. But my understanding is that if you're just practicing, if you're doing meditation with the wish to attain uh, the jhanas, uh, you have to start with the first one. You can't go to the second one be ha before having had the first one. So if you're just doing the practice to attain a jhana, I don't think that is invariable karma or immovable karma. You have to actually have, you have to have achieved an actual jhana, which is a meditative state, a meditative um, absorption, a very, very, very strong state of concentration. So it's only those who have achieved that who can actually be born in the uh, the form realm in the concentrations. So I think that while you're still on your way to attaining a jhana and you haven't yet attained a jhana, you're not accumulating immovable karma. It's only on the basis of having attained uh, one of the jhanas that you accumulate immovable karma. The reason it's called immovable or invariable karma is because if you have developed that kind of, or you've, you've accumulated that kind of karma, like to be born in the first uh, level, the first jhana, it cannot change to something else. It cannot transform into the karma to be born in some other realm. It's definite to be, you know, to bring about that realm that kind of rebirth. <clears throat> and um, some religious practitioners, for example, in the Indian traditions, um, they aspire to be born in those realms, seeing them as wonderful states, like, you know, very blissful and you live a long time and you have very little suffering. They're also very pure. Your mind is much more pure than in the desire realm. Um, and some of them even consider that one, you know, one of those meditative or one of those um, realms is, is actually nirvana because it's so pure and blissful and peaceful. They actually think that is nirvana. But according to Buddhism, it's still samsara. So you live there, you stay in those realms for a while, but eventually your karma to be born there runs out and then you die and are again reborn in some other realm. So they're not is not permanent lasting peace and bliss. It's just another samsaric rebirth. So from the Buddhist point of view, we're discouraged from aspiring to be born in those realms. However, um, those who are following the Buddhist path and aspiring to attain nirvana, actual nirvana or enlightenment, they, they might still cultivate these meditative absorptions, not just to be born in those realms and enjoy the, the pleasure there, but because of other reasons, um, bodhisattvas actually said that um, bodhisattvas who are following the sutra path, not the tantra path, bodhisattvas who are following sutrayana have to develop all four of the jhanas, all four of those meditative um, states, plus the four formless absorptions. They have to develop those meditative states, those states of mind, because it helps them cult, um, with what they call mental dexterity. <laughs> There's actually practices where, you know, you kind of mentally jump from one to another, you kind of go up and down and, and it, but they're primarily using emptiness as the object. So you can, use, you can develop these jhanas and meditative absorptions and then use those states of mind to meditate on emptiness. And it's, they're very powerful, <clears throat> very powerful states of concentration. So they're very useful for um, developing a deeper understanding of emptiness. Also bodhisattvas, um, because they want to help all sentient beings, so they, once they gain control over rebirth and they get to go where they want in their next life, um, they will take birth in, 
at least the form realm, maybe not the formless realm, but the form realm in order to teach the beings who are there and guide them to get out of samsara. <clears throat> so there could be bodhisattvas were born in the form realm. And also the other practitioners who aspire for nirvana, the hearers and solitary realizers, they will also sometimes take birth in those realms because it takes many lifetimes to reach nirvana. Um, some do it quickly, but some take many lifetimes. And so while they're still working towards nirvana, <clears throat> they, if they can, they will be born in the form realm because it's, it's more peaceful there. It's a better atmosphere <laughs> for meditation <laughs> rather than this world. So I'm just trying to make the point that in those realms, the form realm and the formless realm, you do find Buddhist practitioners. You find you can find bodhisattvas. You can also find aryas uh, here in solitary realizer aryas. <clears throat> so don't think that it's only for beings who are attached to the bliss of meditative concentration who go there just to enjoy, you know, a nice peaceful state of mind. So there are Buddhist practitioners there as well. Anyway, if you're interested in more about this topic, it's very complicated, but it's very interesting as well. There's a book called Meditative States by Lati Rinpoche. It's got teachings by Lati Rinpoche and Demolocha Rinpoche. So it's all about those the four concentrations and the four formless absorptions. Anyway, so now let's move on. Next slide. Um, Okay, so links, uh, I put them together on one slide, um, contact and feeling, six and seven. <clears throat> These are both mental factors. So contact is the mental factor arising when an object, a sense power and consciousness come together. Okay, so we have this body, and with our body, we have these, um, uh, well, the first five sense powers, because they are all physically based. So we have, for example, our eye sense power somewhere in our eye. And um, so that enables us to have the experience of seeing things, to see objects. And there's always an object that is seen. And there's a consciousness that sees, the eye consciousness. So there's three things involved in the experience of seeing. The sense power, the object, and the consciousness. So those three things need to come together in order for that experience to happen, visual experience or visual consciousness. So contact is said to be the mental factor that occurs or arises when those three things come together. It's contact, being, you know, having contact with an object. And it's said to also distinguish objects as pleasant, unpleasant, or neither, neither pleasant nor unpleasant. Um, and this becomes more clear when we look at the next um, link of feeling. Number seven is feeling. So feeling is um, another mental factor, and it's said to be omnipresent, ever-present, meaning every single experience that we have, every instance of any of our six uh, consciousnesses always has a feeling component, and feeling is a mental factor. And there's three kinds of feelings, pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. And so it's good to, you know, try to pay attention to your mind, your experience and notice feelings. So when we see an object, there's one of those three feelings. If it's an attractive object, like a beautiful, fresh flower, then we probably have a pleasant feeling. If it's a pile of garbage in the compost bin, <laughs> all moldy and covered with flies and so on. We probably have an unpleasant feeling. <laughs> and then other objects, maybe just something really plain, like looking at the, you know, this table, we probably don't really feel pleasant or unpleasant, just neutral, 
kind of in between. But each person has their own feelings. So what one person might find pleasant, somebody else might feel unpleasant and vice versa. So not everyone has the same um, way of reacting, the same kind of feeling arising when they see something or hear. It's obvious with sounds as well. Yeah, it's different kinds of music. Some people it's pleasant, somebody else it's, oh, turn that off, it's horrible. <laughs> And then the opposite, you know, I remember when I was a kid and we'd play our music and mom would be, oh, <laughs> then she'd put her music on and we'd go, oh, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So each person has their own um, way of reacting, responding to different sensory objects. And it's said that feeling is the ripening of karma. This is one way that karma ripens in the kind of feeling we have. I never fully understood that, but that's what it said in the teachings. So it depends on our karma, the kind of feeling we experience. <clears throat> so anyway, so I put these two together because they're, you know, they, they follow right after each other and they're connected. Contact is the cause of feeling. So with contact, the very first moment of contact with an object, seeing an object, there's already some discrimination that, it, that it's either pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. And in the very next moment, that kind of feeling will arise. It'll be a pleasant feeling or an unpleasant feeling or a neutral feeling. <clears throat> And um, then, yeah, the pictures are a little fuzzy, but in the Wheel of Life, contact is uh, depicted as a couple embracing, a couple making love. And feeling, <laughs> the picture related to feeling is a man with an arrow in his eye. <laughs> Pretty gross, but yeah, very strong uh, type of feeling there. So contact and feeling actually occur constantly. Both, both of these are ever-present, omnipresent mental factors. So all through our life, we are having contact and feeling. Our mind experiencing objects and having a feeling uh, about that object. And then uh, the next... Um, Next slide. Yeah. Okay. So eight and nine, again, I put these together because they're closely related. So eight is craving. So craving is a kind of attachment. And it often, not always, but often follows after uh, feeling. Because uh, it said there are three types of, of craving. One is craving to not be separated from pleasant feelings. So when we have a pleasant feeling, almost immediately there's a craving to not be separated from that. We want that pleasant feeling to last, to keep going. We want to keep having it again and again. And we usually mistakenly think it's the object that we need in order to have that pleasant feeling. And so that's why we get attached to objects. I need this object. I need this person in order to have that pleasant feeling again and again and again. <clears throat> and the second type of craving is to be separated from unpleasant feelings. So when we have an unpleasant feeling, it's the opposite. Oh, I want to get away from this. I don't want this. I want this to stop as quickly as possible. And because we tend to think it's coming from the object, the object is making us feel that way. So then we want to get away from the object, throw it away, destroy it or, or whatever. Um, and then if we're not careful, that can lead to um, various forms of anger, aversion, irritation, anger, hatred, violence, even, you know, um, doing something destructive. And the third kind of craving is for neutral feelings to continue. So neutral feelings are kind of, well, they're not so bad, <laughs> not so bad as unpleasant feelings. So 
it's kind of a nice place to be complacent. So that's said to be another form of craving, just to have the neutral continue. We also tend to not like things to change too much, you know, we get into a sort of nice, comfortable place, nice, comfortable situation, and we want it to continue, not change in any way. So there's these three types of cravings. And so what normally happens with people, ordinary, especially ordinary beings who have no knowledge of the Dharma, no training in mindfulness, as you know, when there's a pleasant feeling, it immediately leads to craving and attachment. And when there's an unpleasant feeling, immediately, immediately it leads to um, the craving to be away from that, and that can lead to aversion, hostility. And then, the, then when we have a neutral feeling, um, that just kind of perpetuates our ignorance because you know we're not seeing things correctly we're seeing things incorrectly we're seeing things as inherently existing even though they're not and um and so yeah we just continue in that mode of being seeing ourselves and everyone and everything else is inherently existing and just wanting to continue in that same direction So these three types of craving can occur all during our life. And the picture in the Wheel of Life um, depicts a man drinking beer. He's sitting at a table and <laughs> just drinking <laughs> one glass of beer after another. <laughs> so this is craving, yeah? You have some nice experience and you just want another one and another one and another one and you're never satisfied. And then number nine is grasping. And this is also a kind of attachment, but a, a stronger, a stronger form of craving. <clears throat> and again, that can occur all through our life. However, in the context of the 12 links, um, craving and grasping refer to specific moments of those experiences that arise at the time of death. So as as we as we're dying, very you know, getting closer and closer to death, just before dying, craving and grasping arise. In particular, grasping at a body. You know, we feel I'm leaving this body and I want another one. And so um, <clears throat> this craving and grasping activate one of our karmic seeds to take rebirth, and that's. Next, uh, oh yeah. So the picture related to grasping is it shows a person um, picking fruit from a tree. So just an illustration of grasping, wanting more and more and more and more. So the next link, number ten. Sometimes it's called becoming or existence. Those are different ways it's translated. Um, so this is a karmic potential or karmic seed that was left imprinted or planted on consciousness back at link number two. So back at you know one and two ignorance, motivating an action, and then that leaving a karmic seed, a karmic imprint in the consciousness. And so if nothing was done like, you know, we do purification practice to counteract our negative karmic seeds. So we don't have to take rebirth in unfortunate realms. So if we did a lot of purification, then we may have neutralized, not completely eliminated, but neutralized uh, negative karmic seeds, um, in which case they, they might not be a cause for an unfortunate rebirth. Because it said, if we do purification, then um, and and practice dharma in general, karmic seeds that could be causes for unfortunate rebirths can bring other kinds of experiences, like a headache or getting flu or something like that. So it it ripens in the form of some much lighter, lesser kind of suffering during this life, rather than 
a whole rebirth in an unfortunate realm. So that's why they say when we're practicing Dharma, if we do encounter unpleasant experiences like getting sick or having other kinds of problems, we should rejoice rather than feel miserable because it means our karmic, you know, bad karma is getting purified and we're avoiding unfortunate rebirths. But anyway, so it is possible that karmic seeds to be born in unfortunate realms can be purified or neutralized. And then karma, good karma that could bring about rebirth in a good situation, that can be counteracted. We don't want to do that, but it can happen um, by getting angry, get very angry, especially our bodhisattva, or generating wrong views, like rejecting karma. Oh, I don't believe in karma. It's a lot of nonsense or something like that. So that can um, damage the good karmic seeds so that we don't get to be born in a good realm. But karmic seeds haven't been counteracted in one of those ways, and they're still ripe and ready. Um, so one of those karmic seeds, at the time of death, it gets kind of nourished by craving and grasping, the previous two links, craving and grasping. They're like, just like with a seed, you know, when you pour water on a seed, it activates it so that it can produce a sprout and then grow into a plant. So in a similar way, craving and grasping water, the karmic seed that was planted back at link number two, and that now becomes fully um, nourished, empowered to be able to bring another rebirth. So that's link number 10. Link number 10 is that karmic seed karmic potential on our consciousness that's now ready to ripen and bring the next rebirth. So the picture in the wheel of life shows a woman about to give birth, <laughs> just about to bring the next life. Okay, then the next link is number 11, birth. So birth is the first moment of the next life, uh, which came about as a result of the previous links. You know, becoming was right at, at the end of the previous life, that karmic seed that's just ready to bring the next life. So now we are in this new life whether it's as a human being or an animal or whatever, any of the six realms. So the first moment um, of that new life is birth. So, you know, usually the word birth, we use the word birth for when the baby's actually out of the womb. <laughs> but this starts long before that, at least in the case of a human being, it's right the moment of conception. And it's also said to be simultaneous with link 3B, resultant consciousness. So back when we talked about consciousness, there were two aspects of that, causal consciousness and resultant consciousness. The resultant consciousness is the first moment of the new life that was thrown by link number two. So at that first moment of, of the new life, there is consciousness present. So according to Buddhism, that's a sentient being. So deliberately terminating a pregnancy uh, is, is considered an act of killing. <clears throat> so in the wheel of life, um, the picture shows a woman who has just given birth, just to give a sense of a new birth, new life. But it actually does start in the womb, in the case of human beings. And some of the other realms, um, uh, there's what they call, I think it's sometimes it's called miraculous birth or spontaneous birth. You don't go through a womb, you just immediately arise with this five aggregates. So there's different kinds of birth in Buddhism. And then 12, the last of the 12 links is aging and death. 
So aging starts in the very next moment. <laughs> the first moment is birth. And the next moment, you already start to age because it just means you're getting older. And um, yeah, so every moment of our life, right from the second moment in, in the womb, our body is aging. And, um, and then death, will happen sometimes late, sometime later. It could be any time. It could be in the third moment. Because, you know, some, uh, there's what we call miscarriage or abortion. So even before coming out of the womb, a life can be terminated. But it could be much later, 80, 90, 100, more than 100 years. So at some point, um, there'll be a separation. The mind, the consciousness will separate from the physical body. That's the meaning of death. And then the mind will go to another life, a new life. And the picture in the Wheel of Life shows an old man carrying a corpse on his back, going to a place of sky burial. So that's what they did in Tibet. They'd wrap up the corpse, bring it to a place where there were people who would cut it up into pieces and feed it to the vultures. So the old man represents aging and the corpse represents death. So the wheel of life, I think in Tibet, they would often have it painted on the outside of monasteries or temples because many people couldn't read or write. They were illiterate. So it was a good teaching tool to teach people about different aspects of Buddhism samsara, the 12 links, the six realms, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> well, I'd just like to clarify something. You said that, um, oh, never mind. I just figured it out. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm doing this in a relatively simple way because for some people this might be the first time you're hearing about the 12 links and it can be incredibly complicated but just to try to keep it simple and then in um like in the friday night teachings here in um Shavasti abbey um we're going through the book um samsara nirvana and buddha nature volume three of the library of wisdom and compassion and um there's a very extensive explanation of the 12 links in there, more extensive than I've seen anywhere. <laughs> and that's coming up soon, probably in the next month or so, we'll start getting into that. So yeah, anyone who, online who's watching this and is interested in learning more about the 12 links, you might tune into the Friday night teachings, Venerable Children. Okay, the next slide um, shows one way of dividing the 12 links into three groups, according to the kind of phenomena they are. One group is delusions or afflictions. So these are mental states that are afflictive. So three of the 12 links are delusions or afflictions. Number one, ignorance, and then uh, eight and nine, craving and grasping. So those are all mental afflictions. And then two of the 12 are actions or karma. And that is number two, uh, formative actions or karmic formations, whatever you want to call it. So that's an action, a karma. And then number 10, because that's that karmic seed that is now ready to ripen and bring its result in the, in the next life, the next rebirth. So those are actions or karma. And the other seven are results. Results of the previous two groups, delusions and karma. So delusions or afflictive emotions and karma, those are causes. And then the results of those are the other seven, consciousness, Name and form, six sources, contact, feeling, birth, aging, and death. <clears throat> and these also illustrate the, uh, the first two of the Four Noble Truths. Um, 
So the, the three afflictions and the two actions are true origins. The second noble truth is origins or causes of suffering. Those are things which cause the suffering in samsara. And the seven results are all true sufferings, the first noble truth. So we actually have many sets of 12 links. Each time we create an action that is strong enough to bring a rebirth, that is part of a whole set of 12 links. And um, so as we go from life to life, we are creating new uh, karmic causes to cause a rebirth, and we're experiencing the results of the previous ones that we created in the past. So let's look at how a set, a single set of 12 links occurs chronologically. Now here it can get really complicated because different Buddhist scriptures and different Buddhist masters explain it differently. So I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. <laughs> I'll just explain the simple ones. So here's how one complete set of 12 links can occur over two lifetimes. This is the minimum amount of time. It's not, a, it's not possible for one whole set of 12 links to happen in one lifetime. So the minimum is two lifetimes. And I'll do it by using an example because previously I spoke about how our present life as a human being must have been the result of a virtuous action that we did in a previous life. Possibly we saved somebody's life. We saved the life of a being. So that would, was a virtuous action and became the cause for the present life that we have. So let's just use that example. So, so life A, a person named Susan, saves the life of another being. She sees a being who's in danger of being killed or dying and feels compassion and jumps in and does something to save this being's life. Okay, so that's the action done in one, uh, in one life. And that involves the first three links, ignorance, because she's still just an ordinary being who thinks of herself as inherently existing and the being that she saves is inherently existing and the action of saving is also inherently existing. So she's still under the control of ignorance, seeing everything is inherently existing. Um, and then she does this action. It's a virtuous action motivated by a virtuous state of mind, compassion. And having done that action, a seed or imprint is planted in her consciousness at that moment in time. And that seed you know, doesn't fall off, doesn't get lost, it keeps going, carried by the consciousness. Um, and then at the end of her life, she's about to die, craving and grasping arise. Um, like they say, you know, there can be a strong sense of grasping at our body and not wanting to leave our body and realizing we are leaving our body and then we want another one. So that that arises and craving and grasping nourish that particular karmic seed of having, you know, having saved a life. And so that seed gets strong enough to project a new life, a new rebirth. So that becomes link number 10. And that means she's going to be born as a human being in her next life. So life B, which is right after life A, Susan takes birth as a Tibetan girl named Droma. <laughs> Just making this up, <laughs> if it's possible. And during that life, she experiences the remaining resultant links, name and form, six sources, contact, feeling, birth, aging, and death. And so that, you know, one complete set of 12 links that started with that action of saving a life um, finishes or 
it's completed in two lifetimes, consecutive lifetimes, A and B. Another possibility in the next slide is that they could take more than two lives, three or more. Okay, so I'm calling these lives A, B, and C. So again, life A, Susan saves a life. We have um, the first three links, ignorance, karma, and consciousness. So that's as before. But then at the end of that life, um, some other karmic seed ripens. Another karmic seed that she created during that lifetime. Or it could have been a karmic seed that was created in a previous life. Because every life we are creating new karmic seeds to take rebirth. So we have this huge accumulation. <laughs> it's accumulating more and more all the time of karmic seeds to cause rebirth. So some other karmic seed ripens at the time of death. And let's just say that's, that's a non-virtuous one. So she gets born as a dog in her next life. But I'm just making, I'm trying to make this a nice story. So <laughs> She's a dog that's owned by a Dharma practitioner. <laughs> and the Dharma practitioner is very loving and kind, takes good care of her dog, but also, you know, recites mantras and prayers and takes the dog for walks around stupas and takes to teachings and so on. So the dog gets some uh, good imprints, virtuous imprints on its mind. And then... Um, at the end of that life, as a dog, again, craving, grasping arise and nourish the karmic seed that was created in the previous life, saving a life, that good virtuous karmic seed. So that one now gets ripened and this dog dies and takes rebirth in the next life as a human being. And as before, a Tibetan girl named Droma experiencing the six resultant links. So that's a good scenario. <laughs> you have one unfortunate life in between, but human lives on either side. But there could also be many other lifetimes. So, so, so life A is when the, the karmic seed is created, the original karma is created. And then life B and life C have to happen consecutively. Life B has to be right before life C. But there could be many, many, many lifetimes in between A and B. There could be five lives or 10 or 20 or 100 or 1,000. Okay, Because only one karmic seed to take rebirth can ripen at a time. And then that throws a whole rebirth. And then, you know, during that life, we can't have another karma to be born as long as we're still in one set of aggregates, one body-mind combination. We have to wait till we die for another karmic seed to cause the next rebirth. And in between, we are creating more and more karmic seeds to take rebirth. So I'm, I hope that's clear. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Thank you so much for your teachings. Uh, I had a question about the two slides before this, um, where formative action is a cause. It's sometimes taught that one of the effects of karma is that you repeat the action again. So is that repeated action um, truly an effect of the karma or is karma always a cause? So link number two, formative action, only refers to actions, not all actions, not all karma that we create, but only karma that's complete with all four factors. And that means it's strong enough, it's powerful enough to actually bring a rebirth, to create a, a rebirth. And so we, we create other actions or other karma that isn't strong enough to create a rebirth, but could re ripen in the form of experiences we have while we're born, like 
um, you know, between birth and death, we have many, many, many experiences, some good, some bad. And those are the, that's called completing karma. So that's the ripening of our other actions that are not the cause for rebirth. But also like the karma to be like uh, link number two, the karma to be born in a particular life. Um, it said that many, there are many results of a karma. So let's say, you know, one karma, a karmic seed causes rebirth, maybe as a human being, or maybe in the unfortunate realms, but that's not the end of it. That karma, that same karmic seed will also bring other results in other lifetimes, such as having results similar to what you did to somebody, or having the tendency to do it again and again, and um, environmental results, the kind of environment you're born in. Okay, so just because a karmic seed brings rebirth doesn't mean that's it. And there's no more results of that particular karmic seed. There could be other results arising later in that life or in future lives. Is that answering your question? Yeah. Is uh, when you say the word tendency, mm -hmm. is that that itself is not a formative action, but is is conditioning formative actions? Well, I mean, let's say killing, um, doing one act of killing um, sets up a tendency to do it again. And we can see that in our life. You do one thing and it just becomes easier to do that same thing again and again and again. So the tendency to do an action itself, I don't think that is an action, but it can lead to an action, okay? So when you have the, the opportunity to do an action and you have the tendency in your mind to do it, then it happens. But yeah, the tendency itself um, doesn't, isn't, I don't think that would be considered an action, but a cause of an action, cause of a karma. Okay, thank you. That's how I, yeah. So regarding the first three, they, they set up a karmic imprint on the mind, which when it becomes ready to ripen, activate it, is the 10th link, right? That's about to ripen into link 11. So the links four through nine have to be the result of another previous chain of events like the name and form, six sense sources, contact, feeling, craving, and grasping have to have been the result of another chain in order that's affecting this chain to ripen it. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a different name and form than the name and form that's the same as 11, a different, a different um, chain of the 12, right? Well, we're, we're constantly, you know, creating the causes and experiencing the results of different sets of 12 links. So when, when our life began, this present life began uh, in the womb. So the, at that point, there was the name and form and, and so on and so on um, that were created in a previous life and that got ripened at the time of death. And then, um, so we're experiencing results of one karmic seed that was created before and then got ripened at the end of the previous life. And then in the middle of that, we are creating more karmic seeds, which will bring about results in the future. And they can kind of crisscross, you know, while we're experiencing the results of one, we're creating the causes for others. But the point of the, well, this way of explaining it, each, each set of 12 links. There's a complete set of 12 links. So there's a name and form that result from one particular karmic cause, but that won't happen in that same lifetime. It won't, won't happen until the next life or some later life. But, but the, there is definitely a name and form that results from the karmic seed that was started in link number two, ripened at link number 10 at the end of a life and then immediately brings the next life with the name and form and the other results. Is that Right, but I guess what I'm thinking is that 
that the one that's number four here has to have been from a previous chain because number the, the formative action that's laid on the consciousness is not ripened yet. And it can't be part of the chain that's causing it to ripen if it hasn't happened yet. Are you, you're talking about this set occurring so, over three so, or more lifetimes. So yeah, well, it seems like it goes one, two, three. And then these other four through nine have to have been from a previous situation because number two can't cause the name and form that's going to make it ripen because it has to ripen. You see, you I'm see? sorry, I don't quite oh. follow. Um, that seed that's on the mind stream at link three has the potential for name and form, six sources, contact and feeling. And those are like projected causes, but they haven't been actualized yet. What actualizes that is eight, nine, and 10 that bring about birth, which comes together with 3B, and that leads to four, five, six. <laughs> no, because nine, grasping comes from craving, that comes from feeling, that comes from contact, it comes from the six, six sentence sources, it comes from name and form. But for name and form to have come from that imprint on the consciousness, it needs eight and nine. So that's why I'm saying they're right, but you have to have ones that are not a potential that actually cause the ripening. That's what I'm saying. So you have to, you, you not only have overlapping um, cycles of this, you have to have overlapping cycles of this, but it's to be happening. That, yeah, there's different ways of explaining it. I'm just trying to describe one how one set of 12 links occurs over a number of lifetimes, two or three or however many. And there is another way of explaining it in causal sequence, starting with one and then going to 12, occurring over several lifetimes. It's in, it's in samsara nirvana Buddha nature, but it's very complicated. And it doesn't involve just one set of 12 links, but two, two sets of 12 links. Yeah, that that's what I'm seeing as it evolves yeah, too, so because could, the craving and grasping are from the previous, another cycle, and they're helping that, that formative action become existence. Yeah. So like I said, I was trying to make it simple. <laughs> just talk about one set but later in the friday night teachings we'll get into other explanations so maybe that question will be answered then okay thank you so yeah we've run out of time i did have two other slides but i'll take care of them next week and then if we if you could go to the last um the last slide homework <laughs> yeah so next week next thursday will be the last class in this part of the of the, the course and then we'll have a break over september and they'll start again in october and when we start again in october we'll do the great scope of the lam rim so we're kind of finishing up the middle scope here so for next week um if you could read the the last part of the easy path on the middle scope determining the nature of the path to liberation. So there, next week we'll look at this, the last bit of the 12 links and then the actual path that leads to liberation. So once we've generated renunciation, the determination to be free of samsara, how do we get out? What is the solution? So we'll look at that next week. And if you can, before next class, meditate on these 12 links just to get a better understanding of them. And I also thought it might be helpful to Try to make your own examples, hypothetical examples of sets of 12 links. Just invent stories of virtuous actions or non-virtuous actions and then try to figure out how they can ripen, how they bring the results over several lifetimes. So we'll stop there uh, and do the dedication prayers to dedicate the merit, the positive energy, um, our session today should be on the screen. It's on the screen. Yeah. So, um, so we dedicate the merit 
to all sentient beings, wishing all of them to be free of suffering and reach enlightenment. And we'll also dedicate for the long lives of our precious spiritual teachers. We can think of all teachers, but also in particular His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Lama Zopa Rinpoche. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Incomparably kind and supreme Tenzin Gyatso, the wish-fulfilling, wish-granting jewel, source of every benefit and happiness in this world, may you have a long life and all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. You who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjunath's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplish magnificent prayers, honoring the three sublime ones, savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. Thank you.